All right, so first thing, I've got a couple papers to hand back. And so one thing that happened this past weekend, um, actually it was like Friday. So like as soon as I got out of this class last Thursday, like, I got sick as hell. Like not like not COVID. Like because I got tested twice because like I was like really sick. I was like had a fever. I was like, damn, I hope I didn't get COVID. When I got tested. They showed this thing like up in my brain and like it was bad. And then they showed up my other nostril just make sure my brain was like totally tickled and it was bad. And I was negative, but then I was like still a fever for like three more days. So on Sunday, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go back and get tested again just in case I didn't show up the first time. I was still negative. And so I had to go through that crap twice. And I never had COVID. And that's just like wrong. I kind of like, I don't I wanted COVID, but like, I was like, damn, at least I could have gotten COVID if I had to go through this crap, right? I mean, that doesn't really make sense, but you know what I'm saying. Like, you know, I, I th you know, y'all know about Egyptian embalming back in the day? That's what they used to do. Like, they used to, like, for, like, Egyptian mummies, right? They take, like, a red-hot poker and, like, swirl around your brain and, like, pull your brains out through your nose. That's how, like, make mummies, right? So they don't have, like, brains inside them, like, rotting, right? Like, I swear they, like, went to Egypt and hired a bunch of embalmers to, like, perform COVID testing on people. It was, like, a job requirement. But, um, so I have some paper. All that to say, that's more or less just an excuse to say, why well, I don't have all your papers graded. <laughs> um, so I'm just, like, feeling real bad. But, um, I have some papers graded. So I have Gabrielle. Gabrielle. Should be in there? I can't look at their brains. I'm Oh, there you go. Sorry. I know you have Like I said, I was feeling like crap. I'm gonna get great. I'm gonna back you. Um, yeah. So today also it's gonna be uh, a little change of pace, somewhat. Instead of going through um, like an essay or whatever, like what we have been doing, I'll be glad enough for everybody. Yes. I know, right? It was your birthday a couple days before that? What's going on? <laughs> All right, if you're forgiven this one time. Um, so like I was saying though, so we're gonna have a little change of pace today. Instead of like an essay or whatever, I'm gonna give y'all like a talk to the class. This is gonna be like kind of one of the um like few days in the year. I'm gonna do the whole like lecture thing, and y'all should probably take notes. Um, so we're kind of switching modes. We've read a couple essays, we've got kind of minds kind of geared towards the whole public policy thing, right? Approach to philosophy, kind of ways to look at the world right now, putting y'all in the forefront. In the ways that like, you think you think can change the world, and ways that you can think can change public policy, right? So now, with the evidence share I gave out last time, we're kind of going into mode of like now making our own public policy, right? And so I'm gonna go through like all the little elements, and, like some of the little things, um, that like a public policy takes, like in order to be like an effective public policy, right? So we're start talking about the final paper, the final project, which is kind of kind of geared towards from here out through the rest of the semester, okay? Like these are the important things to remember, like a public policy kind of needs and a way to think through. Um, what what public policy is and what it has to have. I hope the green marker works for really my phone. I'm going to run next door. It's going to be One time I'm 
Good, y'all. Right back. Look at Calgary's platform. I'm going to need your markers. I think we have them. I got two more. That's an hour. Let me one more. So. Okay. All right. So, now. All right. So, the first thing. So, this is kind of the overview of like, what a public policy needs. So, there's several steps you have to go through in order to make like a public policy function like in the real world, like, like get a public policy proposed, right? And the first thing is called, and the names might sound kind of weird, but I'll explain why they actually are important why they work this way, right? It's called inheritance. I-N-H-E-A-R-E-N-C-Y, inheritance, like inherent, right? That's something that is inherent. <clears throat> so inherency is showing why the problem we're trying to address, right? What the problem is, is inherent to the status quo, which means like why the problem isn't going to go away by itself. Okay, so when we say something is inherent, like I'm an inherently a happy guy, right? It means like I'm always a happy guy. It was a bad example, but I'm saying like something is inherent, right? Like that hat is inherently red, right? That hat is inherently white. As a part of it, just being part of your existence, right? The thing has a certain characteristic, right? So I said something is a problem that is inherent to the status quo, right? That means that it's something that is entrenched and is not going away, right? So for example, if my problem I was trying to solve was like, I don't know, like um, the problem is the federal, the federal budget has a deficit of $4 trillion, right? And that's not inherent to the status quo because every year that's going to change, right? If we raise taxes or if we lower spending, right? And that deficit is going to change year to year, right? So it's not a problem that's inherent. Something that's like you can't, like, it's not intractable from the status quo, okay? So, inherency is the first thing you have to look at in a plan. So, it shows why, more or less why you need the plan. Why you need the plan. The plan is, we'll get this right. The plan is like the public policy you're going to propose changing, right? The plan is the actual steps you're going to take in order to change the public policy, okay? So, inherency is what's going on in the status quo that makes it intractable, okay? And then what's important under inherency is the inherent barrier, the IB. So, inherent, I N H E R E N T, barrier, like, B-A-R-I-E-R. I can think like the wall, right, that's making it so the public policy won't get passed right now. Like, okay, basically it's saying, like, okay, if your public policy was such a good damn idea, right, then why isn't somebody in Congress already passed? Like, what, what stops anybody from actually needing your plan to go into effect, right, to actually change things in the world? Like, why is it already going through, right? Um, and that's, and we'll get to that, um, I mean, we'll get to it later on a little bit about how it affects plan. Right now, it's going under inheritance, right? You have to prove right, right now the problem exists, right? It's not going to go away by itself, right? It's not like the problem is that the migratory patterns of sparrows, as soon as sparrows migrate, all the bird poop's going to go away. The problem is solved, right? It's like, okay, right now the status quo has a problem that can't solve itself. It's not going to solve automatically, right? And also, there's something that's preventing it from being uh, solved, all right? So, next thing you need, and also, if at any point in time during this, like, me just talking at y'all, if y'all like, you're talking noon speak, like, you know understand what you're saying? Put your hand in the air. I'll go ahead and clarify whatever. So, really, really, I'm not joking. I'm not going to, like, throw markers at anybody or anything. Like, just really, if it's not clear, please put your hand up and I'll clarify as much as I can, okay? okay. More or less what inherency is? More or less? All right, cool. The next thing is harms. So, harms is what it sounds like. It's like, how is what's going on in the status quo bad, right? How is what's going on in the status quo? In case you know, status quo, stat quo. You hear it in some like hip hop songs. I think you said some stat quo in a couple songs. That was in high school. It's the 50 cent. Um, 
status quo is like the system right now. It's like what it literally means like the status of now, right? How things are right now. But I say status quo, it means like before anything changes, like like right now, the status quo is Donald Trump is president of America, freaking um, Mike Pence is the vice president of America, right? And that's close to the speaker of the house. That's the status quo. Like before any elections happen, before anything changes, right? That's the way things are, right? All right. The harm are the bad things that are happening in the status quo that we're going to talk about, our plan is going to address, right? So, for example, um, let's do like a, 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 a mock up plan, right? An ID here, right? So, this set of out the harms of the plan we're going to make later on, right? Is about coronavirus, okay? So, let's go ahead and just like think out loud a little bit. What, what are some harms we have right now from like coronavirus? Why, why is coronavirus bad? It might seem like a few questions that happen. What are things that coronavirus is causing right now that are bad in the United States? Yeah. Yeah. Death, right? Yeah. So people are dying, right? People are out of work. Now, why are people out of work? Right. Okay, good, good. So, so that's good. So what I'm saying is that there's a two-point thing, right? So we would have, like, What's called a sub point, right? So, like the place that the reason people are out of work, right? That's true. That's a harm, right? The, the, the reason they're out of work is not like coronavirus makes people out of work directly, right? It does, but it does it through government shutdowns or through mandatory shutdowns or capacity on places, right? And so, the harm would be that it forces like either capacity or mandated shutdowns. Right, and this causes the sub point, right? Which is this is makes people be out of work because they can't go to jobs in the past, right? Or if you like own a nightclub or you work at a nightclub or whatever, or like a bar, right? That has to be mentally shut down, right? You don't get to go to work at all. Or like, I don't know, are tattoo parlors open in Texas right now? Yeah, that's cool. Um, in North Carolina, where I came from before I was here, right? Like they touched it on all tattoo parlors. There's this guy who like opened a tattoo parlor and then like came and arrested his ass as he was like tattooing somebody. I feel real bad for the guy. He was like tattooing, like dragging him off because he's trying to tattoo this poor guy. Like, I hope he gets to finish that for free whenever the guy gets out of jail. I wonder if the guy's in prison doing like prison tattoos right now. It's probably still legal, right? I'm just kidding. I think he's out. But anyways, um, so yeah, so you have um, you say, what do you think? You say unemployment or out of work? You think it causes unemployment raises or just people are out of work? What do you say? Out of work? Okay. A work. Well, four of them work. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. So they're actually, so there is, so both people are out of work because they can't go to their job, right? And there is unemployment because they have industries that are like actually shutting down and do some passive, right? Yeah, cool. Like actual, true, what we call like true unemployment, right? So there's like, when we look at unemployment statistics, generally speaking, I and mean, this might not be really for everybody's like policy they're going to work. It's not everybody's going to do with like job sector stuff, probably, right? People do education systems or sex trafficking or some other. Like you basically you can do whatever other policy you want to address in, in, the, in your final project, right? And we'll get to researching that starting next week at some point in time, right? But like right now, right? Just um, when I talk about things like, oh, this is how unemployment's forget or whatever, it's more just like general knowledge. There's something you know, like whenever, or, or you feel like just like listening to PBS or something, or you listen to the radio. We're talking about unemployment. Like, just this kind of helps you know what they're talking about, I guess, if you haven't, like, been told accurately before. But people just say a lot of shit nowadays and, like, don't actually, like, explain stuff. So, like, I'm trying to do that whenever I can. Right? So, there's a difference between, like, people who are out of work and, like, real unemployment numbers, right? Like, real unemployment numbers for people who, like, not only are unemployed but can't go back to work, right? Either like their workplace closed because of COVID-19, right, which is legitimate unemployment, right? Or like their industry actually downsized and cut their jobs out, right? So if you, for example, are like on what's called a furlough, and people hear furlough ever, right? That's when like your nightclub you work for or like your bar you work for, right, calls up and says, hey, you can't come to work because we're closed down for three months or whatever, right? Then your furlough means you still have a job there, technically speaking, right? You're not truly unemployed. You can't go to work, right? So you still like, don't have any wages coming in. It's just, it's just as bad for you as like, being unemployed, right? But it doesn't actually affect the unemployment numbers for the county or the state or the country, right? 
So, for example, during the whole COVID thing, we have like the unemployment numbers around like 42 million, I think it is, right? Unemployed folks. Like, if you count the people who are furloughed too as unemployed, it'd be like 75 million, right? So, like, you know, the government kind of like always cooks the books with everything, right? Is they have different classifications of stuff, right? You have like unemployed workers and you have like furloughed workers, right? And because of that, like, they're going to kind of count them however they want, right? So, we have actual unemployment too, right? Which means, like, your work site shut down, like, your job has actually disappeared, right? And it means that whenever the COVID, so the unemployment is maybe a harder thing to deal with because when the freaking uh, COVID goes away, right, the unemployment doesn't necessarily go, go away right away, right? Because you got to find another job, you got to apply again, you got to get rehired, or the company, I mean, if you work for like a mom and pop restaurant that had to close down for like two weeks, right? That's all the money they had, and poof, they're gone now, right? Then that job ain't coming back from the COVID thing ends, right? So, the thing to remember about harms too, and this is so we're gonna list all the harms we can think of right now, right? Eventually, somewhere down here after the plan, you have something called solvency. This marker better not die on me. Um, which is like you gotta try to prove how the plan solves all your harms, right? So when we list, when we're brainstorming, right, we're listing all the harms. That's good. Like we can list them, like a whole bunch of harms, right? When we actually go to write the public policy, right? The whole idea is that your plan, which is going right here, right, which is the policy you're proposing or proposing to change to, right, actually solves all of your harms, okay? So we might, when we're brainstorming for our policy papers, right, we might end up freaking right now, like a whole, like, page and a half of harms, like, life sucks, right? Stuff is tough, right? But, like, we actually get to write in the, the actual policy itself, right? We have to think about whether or not our plan can solve all of these problems, right? If the plan can't solve all the problems, all the harms for this, we should take them off our thing, right? It's ultimately like the plan is like, okay, like, we're got COVID capacity, like, out of work, unemployment, and, like, our plan solves, like, some debt, right, and nothing else. And, like, listing all these things at the front end saying, like, look at all these terrible things that we're not going to fix, right, is not beneficial to actually passing our plan, right, into, into law or to changing the policy, okay? So this is just, like, but it's good, though, right? We, we'll keep going here in a minute, and we'll list all the harms, right? And if we can come up, I mean, ideally, right, we could come up with a plan that's going to solve all the harms. Like, that'd be great. That would be, like, a perfect world, right? Odds are, if we had a plan that was going to solve all of them, it would either be, like, way too long. Y'all are going to write a 40-page paper, unless you really want to. Um, I have students once wrote, like, I have students who do with their final project on, like, a plan to, like, first strike against North Korea if North Korea was going to use nuclear weapons on us. It had, like, part of, like, the military, like, plan written out and everything. It was, like, 42 pages long. Like, bro, like, cool, but, like, this is a like an eight-page paper. <laughs> and he, like, went to town. I was good for him. He was great. I gave him an A. But, like, yeah, he went in. <laughs> so, anyway, point B. I mean, he was even, like, there's some, like, oh, great, the Navy SEALs will attack this base and this base and this base. And, like, I'm like, all right, man. All right, anyways. So, the point being that we have we have more homes from a brainstorm, right? That's fine, right? And, and but we want to make sure that the plan ultimately solves them all. Because that's just our, like, the last part of our, or the next to last part of our paper is solvency which is showing how all these harms are solved by the plan, right? So let's talk about some more harms. Where's some more harms from COVID? What are we talking about? So and when we talk about harms, too, like, we don't have to be just, like, materialistic harms. Like, I mean, you can look like, like uh, social harms, too. Like, there don't have to be, like, merely um, material, monetary, like, you know, hard number of things. It'd be like, well, be like, so, for example, um, because of, like, people or People being out of work or unemployed, right? Or people being at home, or right? Like alcoholism rates come, right? Drug abuse rates, child abuse rates, spouse abuse rates way up too, right? I mean, just by statistics, right? And so, like, apparently, people don't like being at home very much, right? Or people when they're at home kind of turn into assholes, right? But either way, right? So we have some others. So even like the unemployment and out of work, right? There's another sub point like underneath this, right? Which is like, how does it affect people who are like quarantined, not quarantined? Like we're having to be at home for a long period of time, right? We have other like social harms that are increased too, yeah. So we could say like so we could just say broadly social harms. And we could like sub point under that, right? Like abuse rates, both like like both like substance abuse. Hey, that's good. Not substance abuse, this marker, I mean. Maybe not. What happened to it? Substance, partner, 
Does someone like spray this board with something that makes markers not work on it? Anyway, this says abuse rate, substance, partner, child, sort of, right? All right. What are some other harms with COVID? You know, what are some other things that happened to the COVID? Sorry, what? Heart attacks and what? A oh, lung damage. So yeah, people who like had COVID, right? You mean like speak? You're more susceptible to those. Uh, so like so, you mean so? I'm trying to be way to like phrase that. Okay, so there's some, okay, so I, I've read some stuff on this, right? So there's like, like secondary damage that occurs, so like these beta 3 particles like pile up um, like in your organs, right? Because of COVID, like you have basically like some cell death, right? It piles up and then like your other systemic organs shut down. Is that basically okay? So we can say like um, maybe a like secondary cause of death, sort of. So maybe under, so maybe under like the death COVID. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Cool. So, so we, not 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 cool. Isn't like cool. Like cool is not. I think I know how to place it in our little schema, right? But I think under death, maybe at some point, is like not just death, like from COVID, right? But like so, so like secondary health concerns, and like people who are dying from damage sustained due to COVID later on, right? Is that a fair way to put that? Okay. Um, I'll tell you about secondary. <laughs> So, or you can just write it like an English person does. X -S 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 secondary. So, secondary like health concern or secondary medical problems caused by COVID, right? Or we don't, we don't, and we don't know what even like this is the thing too, right? Is we don't even know what. So, say we have a good treatment, right? And there's a whole debate over whether hydroxychloroquine is like legitimate or not or whatever, right? Like. Medical studies are like, or actually doing medicine stuff, are pretty good at showing that you do on hydroxychloroquine for whatever, right? More or less, the COVID is not going to hit you as hard, right? But what the damage of hydroxychloroquine to people who like take hydroxychloroquine for forever, like that's not it really either, right? And that's because, okay, you can take it like for like gout and for um, like, what else is it? I was going to say glaucoma, not glaucoma. It's like gout and for like psoriasis, or not psoriasis, cirrhosis, that's psoriasis, yeah, psoriasis. Um, and like that's fine, but the whole way it works, right? Is it knocks off free radicals, like it attacks like free radicals on your cells, right? So if you make out those free radicals because we got those conditions, like what's it gonna actually do to your cells that are healthy? Like, we don't really know that. And that's gonna take like a number of years before we actually know like what happens when you take it and you're in got those conditions, right? So yeah, so even that, right? Or or like whatever the, the um, vaccine is supposed to come out with, right? Or any of the other treatments that come out with, right? Like what are the long-term effects of those for people, even if you have COVID, right? Like we don't really know because they're new drugs, right? And so, like, even if you just were to say, so, like, so under the death sub or subheading, right? There's a secondary medical complication. There's a complication from treatment, right? Right? <laughs> Did you take a COVID vaccine for the government? Well, you may be a new millionaire, right? <laughs> and it's like, well, there's four of us left. Well, you may be a quadrillion. Right. So. Oh, exactly. Right. If I was like shooting up, like give me money. I don't suggest that, just for the public disclaimer. All right. So, what else we think we think of? So we have a lot going on, a lot of ways here, right? Well, any other harms we can think of under under the COVID heading, right? <clears throat> Well, I guess we could go like broad scale, right? Come like economic harms, like the, the GDP, like the whole like the economic situation in the world is kind of precarious, right? So we have like grand scale economic harms, right? No, for the political division, most definitely. It's been so political. I swear if somebody spray this board like up from here up with something that makes the mark on that right. Right, political harms, yeah. So the political harm in that political division, right? Like the country's like more divided, more angry each other than ever. Because COVID's kind of been a thing to like yell at the other side about, and know what side you're on, right? Mm -hmm. 
like economic harm is more broadly, right? Like our GDP is down, the world's GDP is down, right? Like people aren't traveling to places, right? Like tourism uh, industry in general is down, right? <clears throat> all right. So we can we can keep going on this probably all day. So but but let's let's look at plan real quick. Harrisburg is dicey, okay. I'm gonna fix all this shit. <laughs> Brainstorm. So let's go into so there, regardless of what our plan is gonna be, there's some elements any plan has to have. Okay. It has to have first, this is good. It has to have funding. Like provide we're gonna have a plan that like we are doing something more than we're doing right now, right? Like how are we gonna fund it? Like if we have to get a bunch of vaccines, then like, okay, how are we gonna get the vaccines? If we have vaccines are just drop off the trees, right? We're gonna distribute like PPE to everybody. We're gonna do anything that, like we have to create something from, right? It requires funding of some kind. Now, let's use the case because there are full of funding in the general special way, right? We're talking about like the US government. Um, so, actually, sorry, before funding, there's something I should put. So, so, first thing is jurisdiction. Sorry. So, this is where you're gonna choose like what level you're gonna be working at with your plan or your policy, right? Your jurisdiction and your liberal plan can be anywhere from each other. Okay, this is the this is the UN is going to do this, right? So everybody in the United Nations is going to do this plan, right? It doesn't even work for things like COVID as much. More like 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 a, like a Middle Eastern peace plan or like a, an anti nuclear use plan, right? Anything you do up in plan or something, right? Or like a you can work at the UN with level of like, like like child sex trafficking and things like that, right? They're like global issues, right? So basically, if you're going to have your plan want to span span more than one country in scope and not be the U.S. right, span the whole world. The UN is a good acting agent to use, right? So jurisdiction is just like who's going to be implementing the plan you're going to be making, right? I mean, this could be anywhere from the United Nations to like the usual level people operate as, like the United States federal government, USFG, like basically like Washington, right? So it protects the US. I think the COVID plan plan would work well on that level or work best on that level. But this could be anything down to like the student council um, of UTPB or like the city council of Odessa or the state legislature of Texas, right? So you can like remember like government's layered, right? You have like the federal government, you have like state governments, you have municipal go county governments, municipal governments, and then like city councils, right? So you have like everything from like the highest level, like the, the federal government, all the way down to like I mean, it could be like the board of regions for UTBB if you want to talk about like mandatory, like one plan that could work good, and maybe we'd get some traction on that next person too. Like y'all still play something like athletics, don't y'all? Yeah. They give you, you know, your student fees you got to take, right? You got lab fees and freaking like recreation fees and like gym fees. Like, y'all got to pay that stuff? Yeah. You, you, you use the gym, the gym open? No. The pool ain't open, the gym ain't open. Right? Like, that's kind of crap. Um, when I was at Kennesaw, um, when I, I was teaching at Kennesaw State in North Georgia, they had this commuter, I'm not really told y'all this. They had this commuter meal plan, like commuter students, like drove in for like classes and didn't know campus, had to buy like a fourteen hundred dollar a year meal plan, and like that was crazy because nobody said during meal time, so they just like gouging students for a meal plan they couldn't use. And so like one of my students wrote a policy on that, and we got that changed um, through some shenanigans, but we got it changed. Uh, but yeah, so so think about obviously we're doing with COVID, right? Probably like the student council at UTPB would not be the person or the group who wants to be like the jurisdiction to enact policy, right? Unless they're like, we're going to declare mask free day or something, that probably wouldn't help, right? All right, but like, so think about like what the jurisdiction is and then when you have the jurisdiction of the funding. So for example, if you're working with the United States federal government, right, you have a thing called like the Department of Health and Human Services, right? Which gets a bunch of money annually to do like vaccine, to develop vaccinations, to freaking distribute vaccinations, to deal with things that affect health and human like health, distribution of like uh, Medicaid, Medicare, things like that, right? So if you're doing with like um, the U.S. federal government, you're the jurisdiction body, right? So the USFG be your uh, your acting agency, right? Or your acting body or in the jurisdiction, right? The funding should be through HHS. Sorry about all the acronyms that are coming because all the government stuff and all these like huge acronyms. But HHS is Health and Human Services. Right. And so that's like the department is Medicare, Medicaid, public health stuff, right? Like the CDC is part of uh, health and human services, right? Uh, NIH, the uh, National Infectious Outline. I don't know what it stands for, but NIH is like the National Infectious Diseases Health Center or whatever, right? It's where like Dr. Fauci works at, right? Um, he's like, that's under HHS too, right? 
So AJ Towns has funding every year that they get, right? So if we don't have to worry about like, oh my God, like we ended up bake sales and like raise all the money to these vaccines, like how's it going to happen? There is money already allocated to things, right? So you can say in a plan something as simple as like funding will come through normal means through the Department of Health and Human Services, and that's like enough to take care of it, right? There are other ways in plans you can like divert funding, right? So if we're we can like sideline the COVID thing for a second, right? Um, and we're talking about, for example, the plan is like to um, eliminate prison sentences for like nonviolent drug offenders, right? Which is like legalized marijuana. Yeah, right. I was like, yeah, really let's pause, right? Um, so like, anyways, but if you were to do that, right, then that would actually generate revenue, be a revenue positive plan, right? Because you look at how much money is spent every year on people in prisons for non violent drug offenses, right? And we're just like, okay, like, not only is like marijuana or all drugs or whatever, around with the like, okay, I'm drug illegal now, right? Then not only would that like reduce the amount of money spent prosecuting people for non violent drug offenses, right? It reduce the amount of money the U.S. DOJ, the Department of Justice, spends on people in prison, right, like tending to them or whatever, and it will also reduce the amount of money made to spend on police, arresting these people, and courts to possibly prosecuting these people, right, and if we have that's what happens to people who are in prison right now, or are already, like, non-violent drug offenses were, like, released, right, like, the federal government would, like, make money, right, but, like, if your plan, or if your, if your harms are things like that, right, you know, like, I mean, you can make a I mean, a, a marijuana legalization case, right? It's like the harm of people like from like, their families, right? Like they have to do prison time. That's not makes them not protect the members of society. When you get out of prison for doing a drug offense, you can't get a job if you're a felon. You have more like your grandma or whatever on you. Then like you can't get jobs. You don't pay taxes. Or tax, like there's a lot of things you can like, attribute to that, right? It's hard, right? And then if your plan is like we're just gonna like not prosecute anymore or let people out of jail who are already there for that, right? It's not it's not a revenue negative plan, it's a revenue positive plan, right? Because you like can show ways that you can actually generate funding for the federal government, right? I'm not saying you have to agree with that. I'm saying like that's like a way of plan to be revenue positive, right? I mean you can look at this plan as revenue positive too, in a way, and from like COVID, right? If we like we're able to get like because the government's can right now, um like the federal unemployment thing that went away. There's a kicker, I don't know if you about that. Like the so during the first part of COVID up to the end of July, so the states are in charge of doing government, um, like like uh, unemployment benefits, right? The states cap at how much unemployment you get, like five hundred. But Texas caps like five hundred dollars, I think, um, a week you can get. It's based upon percentage of the wages you earned before you were unemployed, right? But anyways, so Texas caps at like five hundred bucks a week. The federal government came in in the first part of COVID thing and said, okay, we'll pay everybody who's unemployed an extra six hundred bucks a week. What happened is you had a lot of people who were like. Making so, so if you if you were you know I don't know I just wait tables when I was in college right freaking at a Swiss truck stop in nowhere Wyoming right I was like I read graveyard shit so I'd like work from like eight o'clock or ten o'clock at night to six in the morning get up and try to go to class it's a shit show but like um I get like four seventy five an hour took like two fifteen an hour minimum wage like in Wyoming or silver wages plus like two dollars for a graveyard shift plus tips. Like sometimes I get like six bucks in tips all night because it's the middle of winter in Wyoming. It's negative 40 degrees out. There's no one going to a restaurant except for me to work there, right? And so what happened is so I would make like, I don't know, like $400 a month, $100 a month there, right? Or like on a weekly basis. I make, say I make like $200 a week. Like $200 a week, right? It's not math, but it's okay. $200 a week, right? So under like the state minimum wage or state unemployment laws, right? I would do like $200 a week, right? Say I maxed that. It's pointless. Imagine $200 a week, right? Here, right? $200 a week. And after that, the federal government would come in and give me $600 a week. So, like, as long as I'm employed at that point in time in Wyoming, right, during the COVID thing, right, I'm now making $800 a week for being unemployed because of COVID. Whereas before that, I was making maximum of $200 a week from tips and salary included, right? So, like, at that point in time, to me, I'm like, like the COVID burn, baby. Like, I'm not going to go back to work. I'm making quadruple my salary, right? So that was a problem for a lot for like people going back to work a lot of times because like, people were literally being paid more money to not work than work to work. Right. And so it's a problem. And they're all on some one way in the end of July. So it's kind of a moot point now, right? But if we're looking at like the funding, right, for the plan, part of the funding could be like, okay, look, if we can the plan is cure COVID or like somehow find a way to get COVID back to work, right? Or back to vaccine distribution or whatever, right? The idea that we could like go ahead and stop paying out massive amounts of unemployment, right? would make it more revenue neutral. Does that make sense? And you figure like all the government's money is in this big pot, right? And if, if we can stop paying everybody $600 with extra, right, for not work, and go back to work and start paying payroll taxes and stuff, then like that would be like a money-saving thing for the federal government at the end of the day.
that make sense? I'm not saying it's a good thing that the Federal Government's not about to jack at. They are. I'm just saying, like, when we're talking about a plan, right, like, that's a way to look at funding, too, right? So I'm not, I mean, some people, maybe, maybe it's not, maybe it's not, maybe it's like a, a boomer thing that you trip them on funding. I don't know. But, like, people, like, have fun with funding for, like, plans. Like, oh, my God, like, I don't even know how, it's a good plan, but I don't know how to do money for it, right? You can find money in the federal government. This is all hypothetical anyway. Like, we're not actually going to go, like, you know, ask for somebody's wallet in the federal government, right? It's all hypothetical. And so because there are ways to find funding in other programs that you're going to be changing with your plan, right? Or things that already exist or in departments you're already working within, right? So when you have, so when you go all right in your plans, right, have an idea for your plans, like don't get worried about, oh, like where's the money going to come from? Like there are ways to creatively get around that. There are ways to like think about that in a kind of a different way. Your plan is probably going to generate some money and lose some money. Unless your plan is like give everybody a billion dollars. In that case, it's probably just going to spend money, right? In which case, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm not against that, but I just can't help you do it. All right. So jurisdiction, funding, enforcement. So enforcement is like, okay, so if your plan requires somebody to do something, right? Your plan requires the businesses, um, or if your plan requires the COVID case, right? That governors lift all restrictions on businesses to open them back up, right? So that the, gov the governor of the state can't put restrictions on business occupancy anymore, right? And that business is open up whenever they want. This is hypothetical, right? That were to be your plan, right? Then the enforcement has to be through, like the Department of Justice or through um, you have the Department of Justice being like, okay, look, Governor, like you're gonna open this stuff up. If you don't open this up, then we're gonna find you in violation of the law and we're gonna like, arrest you, right? Or if you have, for example, the um, legalization of marijuana um, bill or the legalization of marijuana plan, right? The enforcement is gonna be through the Department of Justice being okay, like we're gonna make sure these sentences go away and anybody who's already involved in the justice system is released from prison, right? And we're not gonna enforce. Um, the mandatory minimum sentencing or, or prosecute marijuana credit anymore, right? Or, for example, if your um, plan was like, make all firearms illegal, right? Ban all guns, right? The enforcement's going to be through like Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Department of Justice because we got to go arrest everybody who's got a gun now, right? Again, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying like, if you were to do that, that the enforcement would be through that agency. Through that. Does that make sense what we're talking about by enforcement? So basically, if, if you're basically enforcement saying, like, if your plan makes somebody do something and they say no, Who's going to actually go there and make them do this something? Right? That's what the government is real good at. <laughs> so something to think about enforcement um, is more of a philosophical and theoretical point, right? It's like anything the government tells you to do, like at any level, the matter it's federal law, state law, a local regulation, a parking ticket, right? Like all governmental policy is enforced at the end of the day, at the end of the gun. Right? Which means that, like, the only way that any government policy works in any government in the world, right, is through a credible threat of violence against people. Say, so, well, that's not true. Like, I get a parking ticket. It's like twenty-five dollars, right? Cool. So you're like, excuse me, I ain't paying a parking ticket. You don't pay a parking ticket. What happens? Oh, yeah. After, after you don't show up for your court hearing for twenty-five-dollar parking ticket, right? They'll get bench warrant out for you. They'll grab your ass and hang you in jail. You say, I'm still not paying the parking fine. F you, government. You still stay in jail, right? And what happens when they come to arrest you? Like, if you say no, it's a parking ticket. I'm not going. And you resist arrest, right? You will get shot, right? Like, you're like, no, it's a parking ticket. Screw you. Run away. Like, it's not going to go well, right? And so, like, anything, even a, a flag you're flying on your property, the government doesn't like it or just gives you a citation for it, right? Like, that's enforced also at the end of a gun, right? The only reason we pay fines to municipal, county, and state government is because, like, if we don't, they are going to come for us. Right? I'm not saying, oh, maybe you're like, okay, yeah, I spent the sidewalk, it was a jackass move, my bad. Like, I should pay a fine, right? Or whatever, right? But, like, ultimately, the only reason why this stuff actually happens, right, at the end of the day is because, like, there's a credible threat for behind it by the government. And the government usually will follow through, right? So, when we talk about enforcement, that's what it means. Like, how are we going to make people do? And so, I mean, when you, I mean, just be aware of that when you say, like, okay, we're going to find businesses $500 and they don't comply with a $1,000, whatever, they don't comply with the COVID thing, right? Like, if a governor continues to close down businesses and when we want to open up, if that's the plan, right, then we're going to find the state $1,000 a day in, like, highway funding or something, right? Whatever you want to do, right? Then, then that's still a method of at the end of the day, right? The quake could be some, like, force and violence against um, whoever is the subject of the fine um, 
for the, the judicial action. <clears throat> All right. So jurisdiction, funding, enforcement. I mean, there's something that's called, see, I swear, it's for like from here down, it's like unwritable, honorable, unwritable, honorable. Um, all right. There's something that's called um, judicial fiat or, or called fiat. Now, fiat just means like, it, it, it means that the whole thing is an intellectual argument. It means like, so we don't, if we're going to argue or debate about this plan, right, whatever the plan is we make, right, fiat just means for the purpose of this exercise, we presume that Congress will pass this law or pass the policy into law as soon as we write it, right? Basically, it's saying you can't have somebody come and argue this. Well, look, like there is a majority of Democrats in the House. This is a plan that some of the Republicans would like, right? Democrats will never pass it. You can't even argue about your actual plan, right? Because you'll never actually pass the law. So, like, huh, right? Basically, he's trying to eliminate the whole point that you like, you can look at like people's voting records in like the Senate and the House. They're like, well, look, nobody will actually pass your plan, so why bother talking about it? Because that diffuses the whole purpose of this exercise, right? Well, the purpose is like, is the plan a good idea? Does the plan actually solve harms that are actually a problem in the world today, right? Does it solve them in a way that's meaningful and actually makes the world better, right? I feel like, well, the dude from Arizona won't have to vote for it, so like, why bother talking about it? That kind of is like, like the worst thing ever. Like, that completely diffuses our argument. So, judicial fiat or legislative fiat is just saying, like, we're going to assume, like, the best for the plan. We assume that if, as soon as we write this paper, right, that it's passing the law. If it doesn't get passed in the law, right, we can't talk about solvency, actually. We can't ever talk about actually how it might solve the harm and things that might actually happen from the plan, right? So, you ever heard the term fiat, F I A T? Not like, well, I guess it's like the car manufacturer, I'll get it later, right? Not bad luck. F-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-A-T-I-
And then there was like some county, and your county did it too, like as a county, right? There's like a county board to make sure it's okay. Everybody in this county, y'all worry about you. you step across the line in a minute, you take a mask off. But here you have a mask on, right? Yeah. So, so it was, um, yeah, municipal level, city level, and then it was county level, right? But then, um, the state, the, the state of Texas, the governor, right, did issue an executive order that said everybody's got to wear a mask, right? So, so let's look at this hypothetically from like state, from state level, right? So the jurisdiction here would be like state of Texas. So S O T state of Texas. Okay. So funny. Like if we're gonna say everybody should have a mask, right? Like, does it, should the government provide masks to people? As long as the government hasn't done it, right? the government ain't even, like driving mask trucks around the city, right? Everybody's like commandeer old ice cream trucks and make them all mask trucks. <laughs> Oh, so like, so every place that you're gonna have a what ton of people in there, you can do that. Oh, so the, the, the responsibility of the private business owner to do it, right? So you're saying, or the institution, yeah? All right, so all right, so do some private. I wish you could all read one writing. I mean, you can't really much of crappy handwriting, but like, it's just like invisible ink now. Right, like, okay, have you gone got no, I call it have, it's HEV. I read from Texas to Texas. Oh, yeah. Uh, they all have have, don't you? Or ATV. They all love ATV, right? You love it stuff? Marcus Street? Anybody read Marcus Street? Without a mask? <laughs> After the 60 days, though, sorry. 60 days, yeah. And then they make sure they make sure they announce it and announce it and announce it. And then they, a, a paper article was released saying that they made it urgent. That was not true. And they didn't want to fire. So they took that away. Right. <laughs> I bet it seems like, like unemployment kicker went away. They're like, okay, we haven't got pandemic right now. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So, uh, anyway, so yeah, so you, the places that you're the private owners, right, are responsible for providing masks, right? That's under the governor's mandate, right? Well, so, so if we are if we are now collectively Governor Abbott, right, and we're gonna make a new mandate, right, to make things to do a better job in here, let's say, right? So like, um, what would our mandate? And maybe mask for mask required, and it has to be provided by all establishments. I'm just thinking about it. Like, I mean, so like you, I mean, with the, the world is our oyster. We can say whatever the hell we want, right? We well, said so you have to make a mask yourself and a Denver Broncos t shirt if you want that to be our plan, right? That could be our plan. But what do you think? Like, places, all places that have like outside customers inside, I mean, the people who are outside our customers and go inside, right? Like, has to provide the mask. No, why not? Like, if you want to go to Sawgrass, but you want to go to Sawgrass, it's not Sawgrass's fault they have happy hours. Like, this is rolling, so it's like, you have to go to school, or like, you're providing one, but like, I don't think that you have to provide like, the customer, like, that target, you provide that. Right. Oh, you know, I get you. Yeah. So there, there are maybe alternate options, right, that provide different ways. So that's a question. And so how do we? This is and this is this is like the discussion that happens in like in congressional meetings, right? The same thing, right? Is like okay, so if a business provides alternate options, right, like curbside pickup or whatever, right, that doesn't require you to wear a mask, are they still required to provide masks? Like, as long as the business gives you an out, right, a way to get their services, right, that you don't have to wear a mask for, right, do they still require, are you still required to provide masks to people? What do you think? No. Oh, that's nice. Man. 
Oh, that's nice. That's nice. That's nice. But like, it's not mandated, though, right? Like, you just, yeah. yeah. Another good question is how come all the masks we buy have their statements on that say this mask is not known by the CDC and the United States government to prevent the spread of any communicable disease? Another good question. I guess we'll have it. It appears to be a headscarf. Yeah. It's important to breathe. It's important to breathe. Yeah. Like, this is what the kind of whole COVID thing does, right? You can die because you can't breathe. Well, breathing is important. COVID's showing that to be true. So, no, I'm with you. Right? So, I think, yeah. So, I mean, as far as like, wearing a mask goes, right? Like, there's different kinds of masks and different levels, right? So, maybe it's just. So I guess at one point the question is, right, so even if the plane is wearing a mask, right, what kind of solvency can we, so we wear, so wear a mask, right, and then wear a mask in what? So if we mandate wearing a mask, right, we make, okay, everybody can wear a mask, and we let's say we go ahead, we make everybody, all the businesses provide masks to everybody. Like if you're going to go, like, there's, like, a little mask ferry that follows you around in your car, and, like, you shouldn't get out because there's a mask ferry to use your mask, right? All right, cool. All right, so and almost said we say, okay, everybody's got a mask on. I'm like, go in somewhere, get out of the car, whatever. Everybody's going to have a mask on. The government's going to provide that. We're going to get Daddy Warbucks to, you know, fund that. We're going to cut that spending on the Texas National Guard or whatever to give everybody a mask. Right? Remember, we have the Texas National Guard distributed, whatever, right? Like, by the way, everybody's going to have a mask. Okay, cool. So then, what are these harms we talk about solving or partially solving by the mask work? So a question that I might with this new executive order we're making that makes everybody wear masks, right, is what does that do to businesses, capacities? Like, or are we, what are we, not, I'm not trying to put people on the spot and be like, ah, oh, they said masks are important, let's kick them out of school. I'm saying so like, if we were to make everybody, if we're doing an executive order, right, make everybody wear a mask, right, all time, like get like surgically implanted masks, like, would part of the executive order also be to like reduce COVID capacities on places and to like open up businesses? Would be part of the executive order? Yeah? Feel like that'd be important to you? The side of the room seems for it. This side of the room seems like I don't know what's going on. So, as part of the executive order, right, we mandate in mask wearing, right? Like enforce it in all businesses, right? Or anywhere. Um, and businesses must provide masks to anybody who's in their building, right? If that were to be the executive order, would we then reduce or, or, or eliminate COVID capacity, we make, we allow businesses to open up percent capacity. Uh, you can't just say that because I hang over. Now I'm so hungry. Whatever that bar should be. <laughs> can't tell if I'm hungover or drunk. Either or. I don't know. I just I don't think it's just guilt. Like it's not. You don't need to think about it. Why risk somebody else dying over it? Well, that's a fair argument. I guess why 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 risk somebody else dying over it? So, I mean, but, no, it's a fair question. Like, it's like, what, what is worth risking somebody else dying over, right? And I think, I mean, as a theoretical principle, right, as a theoretical idea, right, that makes sense, like, right? Like, why you will indulge yourself and whatever, like, go get some booze or whatever if it could kill somebody, right? And maybe the answer is, well, because, like, if only employees who are employed by grocery stores are the only ones working, right, that has some other social costs that also end up with people dying from other things. Right. I'm not saying like well, I'm saying like this is this is more of a balancing act, right, than, than it initially appears, maybe. 
Like if it could be a simple thing, it's like, okay, should I be down a grocery store and, or like Amazon's gonna drop boxes of groceries in everybody's backyard every day or something, right? Then that'd be like an easier solution. But then what happens to everybody else is like now completely like unemployed. Like you're like, we're getting anything but a grocery store. Right? There's other social costs to consider that. And what happens to the economic to be like so there's more that goes into grocery stores than just grocery stores, right? There's truck supply chains, there's people who work at like poultry processing plants and meat processing plants and farmers and like vegetable freezers and like Put something there. Yeah, so I know, and it becomes a method like of, of like, I mean, crowd control almost, right? And so we're talking about like a farm, right? There, then this is why I was talking about farm. Like there are other farms that just like COVID kills people, which it does, right? And it's a problem we should deal with and address, right? And people out of work is a problem, but but it's also like there's a, a threshold of like social panic, right? A threshold of like um, people just like you know turns into Mad Max, right? You ever seen the movie Mad Max? Really old movie. Mad Max. It's like, I don't know what happens, but more or less, like, it's Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner and Nicholas Cage, they look a lot alike. Um, one of them's like out in the middle of the desert with like roving bands of marauders with chainsaws, like, trying to fight each other over the last cans of gasoline in like America. I guess like the nuclear holocaust has happened. So it's like basically like it's like um, West Side Story, but with like machetes and like chainsaws and gasoline. Yeah. yeah, people go crazy. People do crazy things. That's true. But if we're wearing masks, we're supposed to have the time to take 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 the time to Oh, yeah. I also make the argument that masks don't work because if you put the heart through your underwear, it still smells of heart. So when you oh, cough, it still smells of heart. I don't know if Dr. Fouch would be able to refute this. But no, but, but, I mean, there's nothing to consider. So, I mean, if the mask is not 100% effective, right, or not 50% effective, it's like, I mean, luck favors the prepared, right? Like, if you get a 5% increase by wearing a mask, it's so good. I mean, better? It's not great, right? But, like, if you tell me, if you tell me, like, if I got, like, not COVID, but I got something, I got um, an infection in my leg, I'm, like, stepping on a rusty screwdriver, not giving me a tetanus shot, right? I'm like, okay, like, there's like a five percent chance if we give you this or if you do this thing, right? You put this like special salve cream on it that we got from the you know whatever market behind the head behind the Sam's Club, right? Um, then like there's a five percent chance you can keep your leg, and like if you don't put it on, there's a zero percent chance you can keep your leg. Like I'm gonna put the cream on, and like hopefully that five percent chance is gonna like maybe save my leg. Right? I'm gonna roll the dice on that. Right, I mean, maybe if you look at nothing else, like the mask is kind of like, kind of like that free. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, no, I see what you're saying though. Like, it doesn't seem like like. So there's different things too. Like, doesn't and 95 masks is more effective than like whatever these are, right? So like, yeah, but these are things we think about, right? It, is if we're, if we're going to write this policy, I mean, this is like obviously like maybe this wasn't the best way to go, like hypothetically, because that policy we're all like involved in deeply right now, right? Or that, but, like, it's a policy that nobody has to answer for, like. Or if they are, then why the hell are they telling us about it? <laughs> right. So I would have to say, let's look if we were to put aside the um the questionable nature of masks in general, right? Or the questionable nature of like whether our masks are doing what they say they're doing. Provide the same do something, right? I mean they do something. Also if you don't wash your mask, you're like just walking around like, like I washed my mask, I was sick as hell last week. That was like I was like, I don't want to be able to breathe in my own germs. Let me put this away. But I was like, damn, that was probably really nasty before that. 
Like, and so like, I don't know how often I'm not, I'm not going to make a poll, but y'all wash your mask every day, right? Yeah, but you're supposed to. That's what the freaking the Falcon 5 pack says, right? It's in like the, the asterisk. It's in the box. It's like, and wash your mask every day. There you go. But you don't wash them whenever though. He's running them. Fair enough. I know, man. I mean, that's why I don't wear my glasses with it. Because, like, I'm like, I, I can't see anything. It's really pain. Oh, wait, not glasses. You have a mask. It's kind of true. That's weird. Uh, <laughs> to real, though. But, I mean, that's true. That's real. But um, so if we're talking about the policy, right? So let's talk about if, presuming the mask. Do um, even if it's just like even if it's just hypothetically speaking, like we're looking at an Abbott right now. So we're looking at not even necessarily like, oh, right, what's going to like cure COVID, but like what's going to get like things back to normal in general. So if we were to hypothetically say, right, more to normal, right? That, okay, we're going to go ahead and allow uh, make people wear masks, right? But because we're making people wear masks, we're going to open up everything, right? And like. Okay, so like that would hypothetically cure or not, yeah, cure. I was gonna say cure the unemployment issue. That's a bad choice of kids. <laughs> hypothetically solves the unemployment issues, right? So it would probably then. So if you have like sub points, I mean, so if we cure, I'm saying cure again, cure unemployment, right? Then we would help. We would hopefully solve some of the social harms too, like abuse, uh, both substance abuse, alcohol abuse, child abuse, going out homes, people are home and out of work, right? So if we're gonna say okay, the mask wearing is gonna reopen the whole, the whole thing, right? Everybody's gonna go back to work. Right, then we could claim solvency for unemployment. It's like writing in white. So we can claim solvency, right? Just doing the mask plan, right? For unemployment, we claim solvency for like the social harms, like the abuse of substance, the abuse of children, partner abuse, right? We can claim solvency for that too. We can at least everything be open up, right? We also claim solvency for um, the capacity, like to the the whole um, the capacity issue and the like. The one thing, one second, the one thing we couldn't claim um, solvency for would be like the uh, unemployment, not the furlough, but the people who actually like their jobs have gone away on right? So like some unemployment we get to claim solvency for the people going back to the jobs that had the furlough and stuff, right? But like the whole the total unemployment we couldn't claim solvency for because like there's still be businesses that shut down and like people are still unemployed, by, right? So all the solvency is gonna say, okay, let's look at the harms we're saying we're solving, right? And see how much solvency we actually get, knowing that partial solvency, right? I'd be able to solve for some of the unemployment, some of the furloughing, right? And some of these social harms, right? Is better than no solving, right? So we look back here and we say, okay, well, here's why, the, like right now, things so inherently, right? Is like why things aren't going down right now. Like people are really, in, when we think of things about plans that don't work, right? Or way, problems with plans, right? A lot of times that's where we can get our inherency from. So we're saying like, okay, there is like the jury's out on whether or not masks work, right? Like masks that provide those songs, people don't have faith in masks, people don't wear masks, particles go through masks, right? So all those things would be inherent barriers, right, to why this isn't being passed right now, right? So you'd ask yourself, okay, if this plan is such a great idea, which makes people wear masks and open everything up, right? Why isn't Governor Abbott or us as Governor Abbott, like, collectively, right, why is this already going to law, right? And then we can say as an inherency, right, the barrier to this is because these things with masks are a problem, yeah? But because, like, it, maybe particles go through it, it's not 100% effective, people don't want to wear them, people won't wear them, right? Those are all reasons why plan to, uh, to mandate mask wearing and open up all businesses aren't going through right now. Does that make sense? Like why that's the inherent problem? Or why, that's the, why that's the inherent reason why the plan is not already being passed? Like if, for example, this ma the mask wearing thing was going to work 100%, right? It was the best thing in the world. Why the hell isn't already the law, already the law, right? Why haven't we already mandated mask wearing and opened up everything, right? The problem is that mask wearing isn't actually like 100% effective, right? Or any percent effective. Or whatever, right? But that would be the inherent. That would be an inherent barrier to why that that law isn't already going into effect. Right? <laughs> All right. So, last thing we'll talk about today is the last plank of everything over here. After solvency, they're called it damages. Hopefully, you can spell it damages. <laughs> My name market doesn't do this. A D V A N T A G E S. Advantage. Advantages. Advantages. All right. Advantages are like bonus things you get. Like kind of like if you do the plan, like the, like a thing that happens because of the plan, right? That wasn't a harm, right? There's something that was wrong, right? 
but like the plan gets you anyways. For example, um, the color plan is more hard to do that with like yes. If you were okay, if you were to say the mask plan, like again, band is like everybody knows or now with masks with flu season, we can make everybody wear masks too, it won't cost them anything more, right? Or like masks make people look really sexy. So like everybody's gonna look real sexy now because everybody got a mask, right? That would be like an advantage, right? So an advantage is something the plan doesn't work. The plan is not solving for, like it's not a harm, right? By doing the plan, you get as an extra thing. A good example of this is like um, the legalization of marijuana plan, right? Don't ever write on the legalization of marijuana, please, God, Jesus, don't. Not all of you. Like, some of you can, but like, try to work. Um, but it's like, okay, like, in addition to like reducing like the prison population, right? And like allowing us to have like more police like directed towards like actual crimes that matter instead of like people just like be picked on the street and being like shopping for no reason because like drug possession, right? So that'd be like, those would be like the harm that's solvable, right? But like the fact that like if the government were like tax, like the sale of marijuana, they would control the sale of marijuana, like in Colorado and Oregon, right? Then like the government would generate like trillions of dollars of revenue, right? Like that would be like an advantage, right? Like it's part of the whole plan, right? That's not dealing with the harm. The harm is a prison population, like the discriminatory like use of over policing in like minority neighborhoods from drug possession, right? Like those would be the harms you're solving, right? The advantage would be by also by like legalizing marijuana and the government taxes, right? You don't make a butt kind of money, right? So that, you understand what I'm saying by advantage now? Something the plan does it's not a harm the plan is solving for, but something my past plan, like that happens that's good, right? I mean, I guess you could argue that like the government having more money is never good because you do horrible crap and then waste it all, but like that's a different discussion. All right, well, that's all for Those are the basic plans of planks or the uh, planks and elements of a policy argument, uh, policy structure. Um, we'll see y'all on Tuesday. If you have those evidence sheets, go ahead and turn them in. Um, I'll give them a look over on the weekend. Um, if you don't, bring them to class on Tuesday because we're going to have to have um, – we're going to go start – okay, also start thinking about your plan, like what policy you want to write. Next week, um, on Thursday, I think, I'm going to pass out a sheet that's like, okay, what's the policy you want? What pisses you off? We're going to in class like about what pisses you off in the world. Like five things that piss you off. Like five things you like in the world that you'd like to make, make other people do. Like make, make make more universal, right? Based on those things, we're gonna go ahead and like start developing what our policies are and start doing research on those. Okay. All right, we'll see y'all next time.